to come up with the same final end product. When you look at the whole process of feed production in this particular way, that allows you to focus on each individual step to basically dissect the whole process and analyze each step of the production process and see where I can manipulate or basically adjust. It allows me to identify quality benefits and the cost associated with each step. And I can then consider product safety, compl uh, compliance with established standards and equations, etc. This can be done, and this is basically a model that you can use in the feed industry or in which you can represent or think about the feed industry by. And here you see the effect of feed manufacturing on quality index of finished products and basically the variation which can be offered at each different step of the production process. Now, this is all fine when you work with absolute values. The problem in the feed industry, however, is that we are working with variation. We buy ingredients truckload-wise, and we have to count for the variation which we basically purchase, purchase with each of these ingredients. The largest variation in grain and feed is associated with the raw materials. That's 67% of all the variation in my nutrient quality and in general quality performance characteristics of the feed is associated with the ingredients. The other 22% with dosing and mixing or the treatment, uh, the 11% with the treatment after pelleting, dosing and cooling. So it is therefore essential that we concentrate on the quality that these ingredients can bring. And this is not a small feat. Here I'm showing you, for instance, these are data generated by Dr. Chung in, uh, in Thailand. This is just the energy concentration as actually measured of soybean meal, 36 soybean meal samples. Just to demonstrate you that soybean meal is not simply soybean meal because the variation is 42% between the highest and the lowest in energy concentration. And remember what I told you earlier. Basically, the key entity on which we formulate is energy. That is the most expensive entity. That is a huge variation. So we need to find quality measures to measure that. The same thing holds true for an Aston soybean meal. Here's a sample of 26,000 odd soybean meal samples and the range in protein concentration simply, ranging in Aston from 45 to 49.5. So this allows, a, <clears throat> this allows us a huge amount of variation that we need to deal with. What is worse, here this is data actually collected by Bob Swick one single soybean meal runs through a total of, I think there were 12 laboratories involved in this, and the crude protein value, as simple as that, the crude protein value measured in these 12 Asian laboratories, and the variation that you can get on the same soybean meal sample. This is tremendous. This is a tremendous amount of money that is involved with that. So, in order to get your procedures right, in order to get your most advantage out of your formulation, your product, you must make sure you have the right analysis and you can, that you can verify those analyses. Same thing here. We really do not buy soybean meal for crude protein. Nobody should be formulating on crude protein. Everybody should be formulating on amino acids and most typically lysine. Here you see the variation of lysine in soybean meal crude, pro crude protein, sorry. The green bar representing the crude protein. And you can see that depending on the year, there are significant differences in the concentration of lysine within the crude protein. As feed manufacturer, I will not formulate on crude protein. What is of interest to me is lysine. But I use crude protein to predict my lysine concentration. And I use KOH in my soybean meal to predict my digestible lysine concentrations. So as you can see, there are large differences. 
And maybe it's worthwhile to point out that generally what you see is that U.S. soybean meals have a higher lysine concentration per unit of crude protein than some of the South American soybean meals. One of the things that feed manufacturers do, they classify suppliers or ingredients according to suppliers. And there is a very good reason for that. As is shown here, looking at lysine digestibility in different soybean meals depending on the supplier. And you can see that each supplier is very neatly grouped. These are data which have been presented by Novus, and they are fairly independent in that respect. So classification by suppliers is a well-recognized principle in the feed industry, which, which you, suppliers, have to take, um, take notice of. Different lysine concentration according to origin. This is basically what I was saying earlier. You see here, there is, of course, a large variation, but there is a fairly significant curvilinear response. Here you see the crude protein content and then the lysine concentrations within this crude protein and you see that most of the U.S. soybean meals are on the upper right hand corner of this graph therefore have a higher lysine concentration. They are of course mixed with a fair amount of the Brazilians but they tend to be slightly lower in that. These are the data that have been generated by Evonique de Gusa. And I think in terms of amino acid concentrations, it's most probably the most reliable laboratory available. These variations then, no matter what your ingredient is, will work through in your measures of net energy, as I have explained earlier. And when you formulate then that variation and that net energy value or digestible amino acid value, need to be incorporated in order to work out a feed that is balanced and meets really the per performance objectives. Then quality, of course, is a fairly relative measure. We need to understand it. We need to manage that. The composition of the raw material that we use for feed formulation can vary greatly. We know that. I've shown you that. And it's not reflected in fixed tabular values. We need to have systems in place which allow us to adjust that analyzed value. And the variability of the composition of a feedstuff, of course, can be considered by use of average values together with a standard deviation. And that is the normal procedure. You calculate an average value, the variation around the average, and in your formulation, you basically formulate with a penalized value the, based on that variation. The larger the variation, of course, the larger the penalty you have to, um, to deal with. Why should we then pay uh, attention to variation? That is fairly obvious. Yeah. Ingredients that are poorly defined can have extremely high variation. That is characteristic, for instance, for some of the ingredients that we have here, like palm kernel cake, uh, coconut meal. Somebody mentioned coco uh, coconut meal that is widely used in the Philippines. The variation in feed composition increases risk, and that has, carries a cost. And to avoid undersupplying nutrients, the degree of overformulation must be proportional and is therefore reflected in the harvest standard deviation or entire standard deviation that you basically formulate with. And overformulation is, of course, costly. We do realize, of course, that we never know the true value of anything, but we can manage the uncertainty, and that's what we do, in essence, by working with the mean. The other thing that I like to emphasize is the whole sampling process. This is an example of how we sample in the feed industry but it really expresses well how reliable it is or, uh, or basically how, how much of an uncertainty we're dealing with. If you take a boat of 